Chapter 16 This is bad. The line went dead, and Wilbur found himself staring at the phone in shock as he tried to process what the hell just happened. One minute, he'd been talking to Tommy about Studio Ghibli movies. Then, Dream was there, and the call hung up. Immediately, Wilbur tried to redial, but Tommy's phone went straight to voicemail without even ringing. He tried again, and again, and by the fifth time he heard the automated voice message, he was ready to chuck his phone across the room. Holy shit. Holy fucking shit, Dream had found Tommy. And Tommy had sounded so scared when he'd said Dream's name. Like he could tell Dream wasn't there with good intentions. Wilbur wanted to believe that Dream didn't know. For the first time in his goddamn life, he wanted to give that bastard the benefit of the doubt, and pray that he was still pretending like he was a good guy, and wanted to offer to walk a teenager home. But Wilbur wasn't an idiot. He knew Dream. Hell, Dream had tried to kill him dozens of times before. The only reason Dream would show up in Eastside at this time of night to confront Tommy would be if he knew about Tommy's work with the Syndicate. If Dream knew that Tommy worked with the Syndicate, he was probably going to want to interrogate Tommy for information on all of them. And if that was his plan, that meant he wasn't going to do it in the middle of the street. He was going to kidnap Tommy. Oh, fuck. He probably already had. While Wilbur was sitting on his ass trying to process what happened, Dream could be grabbing Tommy right now and dragging him to who knows where. No, 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 no. This was the worst case scenario. This was exactly what Wilbur had wanted to prevent this entire time. He couldn't breathe. He had to get up. He had to go save Tommy before Dream kidnapped him, goddammit! But his thoughts were racing, and his heart was pounding in his ears, and he couldn't breathe because what if Dream hurt Tommy? What if he pulled out all the stops on the interrogation? That fucking monster would do it. Wilbur wouldn't put it past him. Shit. He needed to get to the cafe right now. Phil! Wilbur screamed, slamming the door open to his room and practically jumping down the stairs. Phil! Techno! As soon as he got to the bottom of the stairs, Phil and Techno were rushing out of the kitchen, staring at him with wide eyes. What's wrong? Phil asked. It, it's Tommy. I, I was on the phone with him and he was leaving the cafe. And then he was... And then he... There was a voice. He said Dream's name and I think... Holy fucking shit, this is all my fault. Wilbur. Techno's shout startled Wilbur out of his panicked rambling, while his father stepped forward to grab his wrists to pull his hands away from his hair which Wilbur hadn't even noticed he was yanking on. Tell us what happened. You said something about Tommy and Dream? Phil questioned in a gentle voice. Taking a shaky breath, Wilbur tried to explain again. I was on the phone with Tommy while he was closing the cafe. Then I heard a voice say his name, and Tommy said it was Dream. Then before I could say anything, the call went dead. And I tried calling him again, but the phone didn't even ring. It just went straight to voicemail. As he explained, Techno and Phil both visibly paled. So you think Dream's kidnapped him? Techno asked, clenching his jaw. I don't see why Dream would have been there otherwise, Wilbur said, wrapping his arms around himself. He must have found out about Tommy working with us. It's the only thing I can think of. It would explain why he's been acting so weird lately. Techno murmured, a deep frown settling over his face. It makes too much sense. His shoulders were hunched as he thought over the previous few weeks in his mind, and Wilbur could practically see the gears turning in his brother's head as he pinpointed all the places he could have figured this out sooner. While he wanted to reassure him that it was all right, that there was no way any of them could have known for sure that Dream was targeting Tommy, he also knew now wasn't the time to focus on any of that. We need to get to the cafe, Wilbur repeated, turning to Phil. For all we know, they could still be there. It was a futile hope, but he had to hold on to something. The only thing he could do right now was beg and plead with luck that Tommy and Dream would still be there when they got to the cafe. Okay, but does Wilbur need to show up there, or Siren? Phil asked, raising an eyebrow. Siren, obviously, Wilbur scoffed. 
already racing back up the steps to grab his mask. If they're still at the cafe, we're going to have to fight Dream, and we can't do that as civilians. Grab my mask for me. Techno called up the stairs. I'll start the car. I'll get my veil. Phil muttered, rolling his shoulders as wings materialized on his back. Don't bother grabbing your full outfits, though. We just need our identities covered. A few minutes later, they were all settled in the black SUV they'd originally driven Tommy to the syndicate meeting in. Techno was in the driver's seat, with Phil in the front passenger side, while Wilbur had the back all to himself. Wilbur was hunched over as they drove, clenching and unclenching his fists while rapidly tapping his foot against the car floor. His mind was still racing as he thought of all the terrible things Dream could be doing to Tommy right now. Tommy. His little brother. The boy who saved his life when he only knew him as one of the most feared supervillains in the Manberg, purely because it was the right thing to do. The boy who he had grown to love as family in only a few months' time. Tommy could be getting fucking tortured by Dream for all he knew, and it was all Wilbur's fault. A part of him was desperately trying to spiral into anxiety, thinking about how Dream could be hurting his brother right now, but Wilbur knew he had to hold off on the panic. If they got lucky, and Dream and Tommy were still at the cafe, then he would need to have his head on straight, so he could choke the life out of Dream with his bare hands. Wilbur? Startled out of his thoughts, Wilbur straightened in his seat. What, Tech? I asked if you knew if anyone was keeping an eye on him tonight. I thought I saw something about Nicky and Jack stopping by while he closed up. Techno said, his voice calm, despite the white-knuckled grip he had on the steering wheel. Holy shit. Wilbur had seen that too. While the Syndicate had never established a formal guard schedule, after Wilbur had told them all about the incident involving them being watched when walking home that one night, the members of the Syndicate had taken it upon themselves to set up times to watch over Tommy while he went through his closing routine. They weren't able to have someone with him every night, but it was damn near close enough, and tonight Wilbur knew he'd seen Nicky say something about heading by the cafe with Jack. But when Wilbur was on the phone with Tommy, he didn't hear any other voices. Had Nicky and Jack been there but had stayed quiet? Or had they already left at that point? If they hadn't left yet, did they try to fight Dream off? Were they still fighting him? Pulling out his phone, Wilbur dialed Nicky's number and dug his nails into his palm while it rang. Hello? Nikki greeted, sounding perfectly fine and not like she was in the middle of a fight. Nikki, where are you? Wilbur asked without preamble. Um, I'm at home. Why? Did you go see Tommy tonight? Yeah, me and Jack were at the cafe with him when he closed up. Nikki explained, and he could hear the confusion in her voice. Why? Is he not home yet? Wilbur frowned. Was he on the phone with me when he closed? Uh, no, he wasn't, Nikki told him. If he's not home yet, that's really not good, because he closed the cafe about an hour ago. What? That's not possible. I was on the phone with him ten minutes ago, and he told me he was closing then. I could hear him locking the door through the phone. That doesn't make any sense, though. Jack and I watched him close everything up and lock the door. Nikki said, her voice tightening as she picked up on Wilbur's panic. Wilbur, what's going on? Did something happen? Taking a breath to steady himself, Wilbur felt his nails cut through the skin of his palm, and he winced as blood began to ebb out. I was talking with him, and he told me he was locking up. I heard him lock the door to the cafe, and then I heard a voice, and Tommy said Dream was there. There was a sharp gasp on the other end of the line. Dream? Yeah, and he sounded fucking terrified. Then before I could ask him anything, the call went dead, and now his phone's not ringing when I dial him. Nikki cursed. Jack and I can be at the cafe in ten minutes if you want us over there, she said, and he could already hear her shuffling around her room. Don't come over here yet. I'm on my way with Techno and Phil. We'll let you know if we need backup, Wilbur said, tensing as they turned on to the cafe street. I gotta go now, Nikki. I'll text you soon. Let the others know what happened. Got it, Wilbur. We'll be on standby. Wilbur hung up without another word, shoving his phone in his pocket and jumping out of the car while it was still slowing down in front of the cafe. He stumbled to keep his footing and rushed over to the front doors of the cafe. 
There were no people there. But there were two things on the ground that made bile rise in Wilbur's throat. One was Tommy's backpack. The annoyingly red bag that had an animal crossing pin Phil had given him, sitting on the front of it, was sitting right in front of the doors to the cafe, tossed carelessly to the side. The other thing was hard to recognize at first, but when Wilbur realized what it was, he sucked in a sharp breath. Tommy's phone was nearly in two pieces because of how badly it had been cracked. It was almost like someone had taken a hammer and smashed it several times over in a fit of rage. That explains why Wilbur's calls stopped going through. Slowly, he knelt down to pick up the phone, wincing when broken glass fell into his palm. This hadn't been broken by accident. And even if it somehow had, Tommy never went anywhere without his backpack. It had his wallet, phone charger, earbuds, pepper spray. Everything that he wanted to keep on him at all times was in there. Tommy wouldn't have left those things willingly. The only option was that he had to have been kidnapped. Gripping the phone in his hand, Wilbur leaned back against the wall of the cafe, struggling to catch his breath as Techno and Phil ran over. Tommy was gone. Tommy was gone, and it was all his fault. If he had been more careful about keeping Tommy's identity a secret, or maybe if he had never taken him to the syndicate meeting, or hell, maybe he just never should have given Techno Tommy's number in the first place. If none of this had ever happened, Tommy would still be living with Ronbu and Tubbo, and Dream wouldn't even know he existed. This was all his fault. He'd been the one to get Tommy involved in their world, and now he was paying the price. Tommy didn't deserve this. He hadn't even wanted to get involved in the first place, but Wilbur had pushed and pushed because that's all he could ever do. He was way too fucking pushy, and could never let things rest until they went his way. He was so goddamn selfish. So selfish and self-obsessed, and now his little brother was being held hostage by Dream. And who the hell even knew what Dream could be doing to him? Dream could be hurting Tommy, right now. And it was all Wilbur's fault. He couldn't breathe, as the words repeated in his mind. All your fault. All your fault. All your fault. They looped over and over like a broken record, as his thoughts began to fully spiral. The panic he'd been clawing to keep at bay, finally breaking out of his chest. Tommy could be hurt, right now. He could be bleeding out. He could be begging Dream to let him go. He could be scared. He could be in pain. He could be fucking dead for all Wilbur knew. His hands twisted tightly in his hair as he struggled to suck air into his lungs. No matter how many breaths he took, it wasn't working. His heart was racing in his ears. His chest was rising and falling faster and faster with every second. And he couldn't fucking breathe because holy fucking shit, Tommy could be dead right now and it would be all his fault. Suddenly, there were cool hands on his wrists, pulling his hands away from his hair. Looking up from the ground, he was met with Phil's veil, and although he couldn't see his father's face right now, he could imagine the gentle expression he was wearing all the same. Will, you, you need, need to breathe, breathe with me, Phil whispered, taking exaggerated breaths for him to mimic. Just breathe. But he didn't want to focus on breathing. They needed to fucking find Tommy. Will, you can't do anything to help Tommy like this. Come on, just work with me. Clenching his jaw, Wilbur struggled to mimic Phil's breathing as his chest stuttered with every rise and fall. He hadn't even felt the tears on his cheeks till now, but as he tried to only focus on copying Phil and nothing else, he could feel the chilly night air tingling against the warmth on his face. Slowly, his breathing began to steady. He let out a few shaky breaths, head bobbing up and down as he copied his father. They continued this pattern for a few minutes, and eventually his pounding heart began to calm, as did the spiraling of his thoughts. Finally, after what felt like ages, Wilbur slumped against the wall of the cafe, his panic attack having fully ebbed away. Better? Phil asked, letting go of his wrists. Yeah, better. Wilbur muttered, his voice rough. Just then... Boots clicking against asphalt sounded from behind Phil, and Wilbur glanced over his father's shoulder to see Techno making his way over to them. I checked the entire block. There's no sign of him, Techno said, 
his hands curling into fists at his sides. Fuck. Of course, Wilbur hadn't thought they'd still be in the area. But to have that last small hope squashed so quickly was like another stab in his chest. We're going to get him back, Phil told them both, with no room for argument in his tone. We just can't lose our heads over this. But what if he's hurting him, Phil? Wilbur asked, his voice cracking. We could try to hurt him to get information out of him. He very well could be doing that. Phil nodded. Which is just all the more reason to focus on finding Tommy as quickly as possible. Do you think he took him to the Hero Tower? Techno asked, while Phil pushed to his feet, before holding a hand out to help Wilbur up. Wilbur grunted as he straightened his legs again. I don't think so. The Hero Committee might be a bunch of bastards, but I don't think even they would be able to legally condone kidnapping a child. So you think he's doing this outside the committee? Phil asked. I don't know. The committee might just be turning a blind eye while Dream keeps everything off the record, or they might not know about it at all. Either way, I doubt he's at the Hero Tower, Wilbur said, shoving his hands in his pockets as the gears in his head began to turn again. What you're saying is that he could be just about anywhere in the city and we have no clue where, Techno then asked, raising an eyebrow behind his mask. Letting out a shaky sigh, Wilbur nodded. Pretty much. Phil cursed under his breath. All right. We have to work with what we can, then. We should ask Quackity if he can find any information through his network. Suddenly, Phil was cut off by the sound of two pairs of footsteps running up behind them. What the hell is going on here? Wilbur clenched his jaw, resisting the urge to groan out loud. These were the last people he wanted to see right now. Turning his head. Wilbur saw Nuke and Ender standing a few feet away from the three of them, the two boys staring at the red backpack still on the ground. Nuke? Ender? Maybe now isn't- That's Tommy's backpack, Nuke said, cutting Phil off. Why the fuck do you have Tommy's backpack? Shit. Just great. Perfect fucking timing. And is that Tommy's phone? Nuke asked, sounding much more timid than Nuke. Nuke turned his head towards Wilbur. And next thing he knew, the vigilante was storming towards him. What the fuck did you do to him, Siren? Nuke snarled, grabbing his shirt and yanking him down with surprising strength so they were at eye level. Beside him, he heard Techno and Phil both shout in surprise, and Wilbur held up a hand to tell them to stand down. I swear, we would never do anything to harm Tommy. Wilbur told the vigilante, keeping his hands where Nuke could see them. We have reason to believe Dream took him. Nuke stiffened at that, but didn't let go of his shirt. What the fuck would Dream want with him? We think he figured out that Tommy was working with the Syndicate, Techno explained, his hand sitting on the hilt of his sword just in case Nuke tried anything. Although they technically hadn't gotten any confirmation that Nuke and Ender knew about Tommy's job as a healer, it was easy enough to figure out through context clues. The lack of surprise from either of them at that statement only confirmed it. Oh no. Oh no, that's really bad. Ender muttered, wrapping his arms around himself. That's really, really bad. So he just kidnapped him? Nuke asked, finally letting go of Wilbur's shirt and taking a step back. He did. I was on the phone with him when it happened, but by the time I got here they were already gone. Wilbur explained. Nuke took another step back, so he was standing next to Ender and Wilbur could see his hands were curling in and out of fists. He took a few breaths, shaking his head as he ran a hand through his hair. This is all your fault, you know. Nuke spat after a few beats of silence, the words full of poison. Tommy would never have gotten involved in this shit if it weren't for you. The words stung like a slap to the face, but Wilbur knew they were true. I know, Wilbur said quietly. I accept full responsibility for this. I should have done a better job keeping him safe. It's not just your fault, Siren. Phil stepped in. The Syndicate agreed to hire Tommy. We were all responsible for Tommy's safety. Yeah, but let's not waste time arguing about whose fault it was. Techno cut in. We need to focus on finding Tommy first and foremost. Taking a breath, Wilbur nodded. He was right. It wouldn't do them any good to waste time arguing about this right now. 
Once they had Tommy with them again, safe and sound, then they could see who he hated the most for letting this happen. And if it was Wilbur he hated, then so be it. God knew he deserved it. Even if Tommy never spoke to him again, it would be worth it, as long as Wilbur knew he was safe. Blade's right, Wilbur said, shoving his self-hatred down to turn his attention back to Nuke and Ender. We need to focus on finding Tommy, and we're going to need your help. Huh? Techno grunted, while Phil made a confused noise. Nuke and Ender both stiffened. Why us, specifically, Siren? Ender asked, voice dripping with wariness. Well, Wilbur had a reason. They weren't going to like it, but they deserved to know. Because, Tubbo and Ronbu, you're his family. Wilbur said, meeting both of their eyes as he said their names. Nuke reeled back as if he'd been shocked, while Ender gasped sharply. How, how the- what- did Tommy fucking tell you? Nuke snarled, looking like he was two seconds from lunging at Wilbur again. Wilbur shook his head. No, of course not. He'd never betray you like that. I figured it out on my own. That was true. It hadn't been hard to put all the pieces together when he was the only one who was able to see the whole picture. The night Tommy called him in tears, asking him to come to the cafe because he'd gotten into a fight with his roommates, Quackity told him that he'd just been healed by Tommy before Nuke and Ender showed up out of the blue. The two wanted to talk to him alone, and Tommy had insisted he'd be fine with them, so Quackity ended up leaving. After connecting those dots... Wilbur had contacted Sam to ask him for the public records on Tommy's roommates. When he saw the descriptions for the two boys from their foster care records, noticing how they both matched the heights and builds of Nuke and Dender, the conclusion was obvious. Wilbur had never intended on using the fact that he knew their identities against them. Tubbo and Rambu were Tommy's best friends, and once he knew the vigilantes that had been a pain in the ass for the syndicate weren't just Tommy's family, but kids to boot. He had doubled down on the syndicate, making sure they avoided Nuke and Ender as much as they could. Still, Tubbo and Ronbu didn't know that. So what, you're gonna blackmail us now? Nuke asked. No, I'm not. I have no intention of using your identities against you. I just want your help to find Tommy. Wilbur explained. Nuke scoffed, clearly not believing the sentiment, but that was fine. He could distrust Wilbur all he wanted as long as they focused on finding Tommy first. But how do you even want us to help? This is Dream we're talking about. He's one of the most powerful people in the city. Ender pointed out, wringing his hands in front of him. Wilbur opened his mouth to reply, but before he could, Techno cut in. Well, I'm sure Siren would love to explain whatever plan he has right now. I think we should probably not continue this conversation in the middle of the street, you know? That was a fair point. They were still standing in the middle of the street in front of the cafe, and while there was no one around to listen in on them, it probably wasn't a good idea to just be hashing all this out right in the public eye. Wilbur's coat whipped around his legs as he tried to think of where they could go. Obviously, they couldn't take the vigilantes back to their own place, and the syndicate base was a bit far. Thankfully, Ender gave them a solution. Since you guys already know who we are, you can just come back to our place. It's not far from here, Ender suggested. Nuke whipped his head towards him. Run, Ender? What? They know where we live. It's not like it's new information, he pointed out. Nuke seemed to be glaring at Ender, but after a few beats of silence, he sighed. Fine. Why the fuck not at this point? Just let the goddamn supervillains into our home. They already know everything else about us. Tubbo, come on, not right now. Ender pleaded. We need to focus on Tommy. Now this seemed to hit home. Nuke's shoulders immediately deflated, and his head dropped as he let out a shaky breath. Fuck. Yeah, you're right. Sorry. He muttered. He looked back up and turned towards the three of them. So, uh, do you guys want to walk over there, or... We brought a car, Techno said jutting his thumb over to the black SUV that he had parked under a street light while Wilbur was having his panic attack. Let's just drive over. Nuke and Ender shared a look before they both shrugged. 
It's not like this day can get any weirder. Ender muttered as they both began to trudge towards the car. They brought Tommy's backpack and his phone with them into the car as they all piled inside. Wilbur sat in the back, with Nuke in the middle seat and Ender next to the other window, while Techno and Phil took the front again. Tommy's backpack sat heavily on Wilbur's lap, a strange buzzing growing under his skin the longer he stared at it. It was some mixture of anxiety and anger, making him unable to relax for even a second as his mind was once again filled with the chanting of, It's all your fault. It's all your fault. It's all your fault. On repeat. Tommy had been wearing his backpack less than an hour before. It had been with him, just like it always was. And now the backpack was here, and Tommy wasn't. Mindlessly, Wilbur zipped open the top of the backpack as the car started up, and saw a dark blue sweatshirt stuffed inside the largest pouch. Wilbur's chest ached when he recognized the sweatshirt as one he'd let Tommy wear when Tommy was still borrowing his stuff, before he and Phil had ordered Tommy his own clothes to have at the house. This was one of the sweatshirts Tommy had taken from him, and just never given back, and Wilbur never really wore the thing that much, so it wasn't like he cared, and was fine with letting him have it. Tears burned in his eyes again and he had to take a few shaky breaths to keep himself calm. It was going to be alright. Even if this was the worst-case scenario, they were going to find Tommy before a dream could lay a finger on him. That's what he had to believe right now. He couldn't let himself panic over any other possibility. The car ride was silent as they drove down to the dilapidated apartment building. Nuke and Ender both kept their eyes on their laps, and Phil and Techno seemed to know better than to try and make awkward conversation with the two vigilantes. When they pulled to a stop in front of the apartment building, Wilbur thought back to the first time he'd walked Tommy home, and how worried he'd gotten when he noticed how poorly kept the place seemed to be. Nuke and Ender were clearly used to it, though. Once Techno found street parking, they all hopped out of the car and headed through the ground lobby of the building. Wilbur was a bit worried about all of them. Siren, Zephyrus, Blade, along with the vigilantes Nuke and Ender, being spotted. But neither Nuke or Ender seemed worried, so he figured they must know when the lobby will be empty. Sure enough, there was no one in the lobby as they passed through, and they all clambered into the dusty-smelling elevator that rattled as it brought them up several floors. Nuke and Ender led the three of them to their apartment, Ender unlocking it and gesturing for the villains to go inside first. While Wilbur knew Phil and Techno had been here before, he realized, a bit belatedly, that he'd never actually seen the inside of Tommy's apartment. It was small, which Wilbur expected, but what he didn't expect was how cold the inside was, how the trash was filled with leftover ramen packaging and little else, how there were several thin blankets filled with holes tossed over a couch that had to be older than any of the three boys who lived here. Wilbur knew Tommy struggled for money. That was why he worked so many shifts at the cafe, but it didn't fully hit him until now just what that entailed. A freezing apartment with no heating. Having to save what you could on food. It brought Wilbur back to days he didn't like to think about very much. The time he'd spent on the streets before Phil had found him. Although he had used his power to convince police officers to not look twice at him, or shopkeepers to look away when he stuffed a loaf of bread under his shirt, it wasn't something he could do all the time. He remembered spending nights huddled in dark alleys, shivering so hard that he couldn't fall asleep. He remembered how difficult it was to force himself to eat the same bread loaves every day, but not having the resources to really make or buy anything else. He remembered how terrified he was of every glance his way, of adults watching him for just a second too late, of having his freedom pulled away from him again. Tommy had fought and gotten his freedom from the system that Wilbur himself had run from all those years ago. And then he put that distrust aside and put his faith in Wilbur. He trusted Wilbur to keep him safe, and more importantly, free. And Wilbur had failed him. Siren? Techno suddenly called out, drawing Wilbur out of his thoughts. Huh? I asked if you were all right. You were just kind of standing in the front doorway. Techno said, giving him an odd look. Wilbur shook his head. I'm fine, 
Sorry, got lost in thought for a second. He finished stepping through the doorway and into the apartment, Nuke shutting the door behind him. Glancing into the small living room, Wilbur saw Ender pulling off his goggles and face mask, while Nuke tossed his gas mask onto the couch. They really were children, weren't they? Although the pictures Wilbur had seen of the two boys from their files were a few years old, they really hadn't aged all that much since then. Nuke, or Tubbo, Wilbur supposed she should think of him now, noticed his staring and blinked. You know, if you want, you can take your mask off too, Tubbo said in a strange voice, eyeing him with a challenging gaze. Wilbur smirked at Tubbo's audacity. Yeah, no thanks, kid. Tubbo raised an eyebrow. You sure? I mean, we might as well be on an equal playing field, Wilbur Soot. Phil and Techno both stiffened when Wilbur's name left Tubbo's lips, and Wilbur felt himself freeze on the spot. Tubbo knew his name. Tubbo knew his identity. How the fuck did he find out? Tommy didn't even know Wilbur's identity, so how the hell could Tubbo, someone Wilbur had never even met before, know who he was? The only people who knew Wilbur was Siren were his family and the rest of the syndicate. That was it. Phil was extremely strict about keeping their identities a secret from anyone who didn't need to know. They had to minimize risk at all costs. That was why Wilbur hadn't been allowed to tell Tommy, despite how many times he'd wanted to just get it off his chest. So how in the hell did fucking Tubbo know? He considered playing dumb trying to act like Tubbo was ridiculous for thinking he was Wilbur Soot. But considering how he, Phil, and Techno had all frozen at the mention of his name, he knew it would be pointless to try and convince the boys Tubbo was wrong now. How did you find out my name? Wilbur asked immediately, letting Honey slip into his words to tug the truth out. Tubbo snorted. No need to use your powers, boss man. We found out the same way you found out our identities just figured it out on our own. When we saw Tommy talking with Siren in front of the cafe that one night, and then started hearing him talk about his new friend named Wilbur just a few days later, it wasn't hard to put two and two together. Ronbu added in, looking downright smug at Wilbur's shock. So they'd known, before Wilbur had told them he knew their identities. They'd just been holding on to this card to see what Wilbur's intentions with their identities was first. And now that they were in a private space, Alone with three supervillains, the two revealed the card up their sleeves. It was a bold move that held a lot of risk, but Wilbur admired it. God damn, and Wilbur thought Quackity was a card shark. Filza, Technoblade, you guys can take off your masks too, Tubbo added, although it wasn't so much a request, but more so an order. If Nuke and Ender were going to be maskless, so were Siren, Blade, and Zephyrus. Huh? Techno exclaimed. How? Phil trailed off, blinking in shock. Come on, guys, it's not hard. When Tubbo looked up Wilbur's public records, he was able to find out he had a brother and a father, the brother sharing the Blade's build and pink hair. People have suspected Siren, Blade, and Zephyrus are family for a while, so it just made sense. Ronbu shrugged, smiling innocently at the three of them. Great. They really had leveled out the playing field. Sighing, Wilbur reached up to pull his mask off, and watched from the corner of his eye as Phil lifted his veil, and Techno set the boar mask on the kitchen counter. Then, Wilbur leaned against the counter and folded his arms over his chest. How are you able to figure it out and not Tommy? Wilbur asked, frowning at the two of them. Tubbo rolled his eyes. Wilbur, if Tommy wanted to know who Siren was, he would put it together in seconds. The only reason he doesn't know is because he's purposely trying not to think about it. We pointed it out to him once, Rambu added, that we thought you and Siren were the same person. He shut it down, but it was easy to tell he was just pushing it away. Frowning, Wilbur stared at his hands, thinking back on his interactions with Tommy. Tommy had never acted like he suspected anything although he really wasn't doing a good job being subtle, and he knew it. In truth, a part of him had wanted Tommy to figure it out on his own, just so that Techno and Phil couldn't get on him about revealing his identity to Tommy himself. 
but Tommy had never seemed suspicious of Wilbur and Siren's similarities, so he just assumed he was clueless. However, what Tubbo and Ronbu were saying made a lot of sense. Tommy knew it was dangerous for him to know the Syndicate's identities. Of course he was going to push away any suspicions he had. He deserved to know, though. Considering the worst-case scenario had happened without Tommy knowing their identities, Wilbur was going to make the case for revealing it all to Tommy as soon as they got him back. And he wasn't going to take no for an answer. But they had to get Tommy back before that could happen. All right, well, we're on the same level here now. Wilbur said, gesturing at his own uncovered face. We need to get down to business. Right. We need to figure out what you need us to do so we can help find Tommy. Ronbu said, folding his hands in front of him. Actually, I think I came up with something I can do on the way over here. Tubbo chimed in, spinning around in his desk chair. Everyone turned to look at Tubbo, raising their eyebrows and waiting for him to continue. He stopped spinning and tapped on his mouse, his computer screen flickering to life. I don't know if you guys know this, but how much information is stored on the database for the Hero Committee? Well, if you're asking if you could find out Dream's real identity or something by hacking into their files, I'd say you're out of luck. Techno told him. Tubbo shook his head. Nah, I'm not trying to find that. But I'm wondering if personal contact information, like emails or something, is stored there. Phil frowned. I mean, from what Daedalus has told us about the way the Hero Committee is run, probably. But I don't see how that would be helpful unless you plan on spam calling Dream to find out where Tommy is. Well, that would be funny. That's not where I was going with that, Tubbo said, typing rapidly into his computer and pulling up the website for the Hero Committee. Do you think Dream has a phone or computer that's separate from the one he uses for his work-related stuff? Definitely. Daedalus told us that every hero is given work devices, and then they have their own personal devices as well, since the committee has full access to the data on their work devices, Phil explained. Technically, the hero committee has access to their personal devices just as well, but they're not supposed to look through their personal devices, unless there's an official investigation or warrant set out against that hero. Dream's not keeping Tommy at the Hero Tower, right? Tubbo asked, pulling up the source code for the Hero Committee website. No, he's definitely not. He probably has a private place that the Hero Committee doesn't know about to hold him at. Techno answered. Tubbo nodded. Just what I thought. So it's not unreasonable to assume if he had to, say, arrange for wherever he's holding Tommy to be empty for an extended period of time. He would have done that on a phone or computer that the Hero Committee didn't know about? That would be logical to assume, yes. Wilbur agreed. Cool, then I know what I need to look for, Tubbo said, his screen turning dark as lines of green code began to run across it. I can't promise anything, but I think our best bet is going to be for me to try and gain access to Dream's secret phone or computer through the ones he is connected to the Hero Committee. Obviously, this might not work, depending on how strictly he's been keeping the devices disconnected from each other. But I have some ideas for how I can find connections between the two that he might not have thought of. Then once I have access to that secret phone or computer he's got, I can go through it to try and see if there's any record of where he's keeping Tommy. Wilbur blinked. That actually wasn't a bad idea. But there was one glaring issue. How long would that take? He asked, furrowing his brows. Tubbo didn't stop typing on his keyboard, but Wilbur noticed his shoulders drop a bit. I don't know, honestly. I could get lucky and find it in a few hours, but that's pretty unlikely. I'd say it'll take me a few days at least, depending on how much I have to search through. A few days. That was too long. Way too long. Wilbur didn't want Tommy to spend another hour with Dream, let alone several days. Is there nothing we can do that's faster? Wilbur asked, clenching his jaw. This is what I can do. Anything more is on you guys. You're the big scary villain organization with tons of resources, Tubbo said, shooting Wilbur a dirty look over his shoulder. Shit, yeah, Wilbur was getting too caught up in his own head, and was forgetting all the resources they had at their disposal. We'll contact Jester, and ask him to see what he can find out through his network, Wilbur said, tapping his fingers against his arm. I know he's got a few mercenaries in his contacts who will work with just about anyone, 
so one of them could have information on Dream if he ever needed someone to do his dirty work for him. Puns could know. Techno nodded. I'd ask Jester about him first. Yeah, that's a good idea. Puns would be our best bet. Wilbur agreed, thinking of the mysterious mercenary who was the go-to person in the underground for discreet work. If there was anyone Dream would have hired, it would be him. <sighs> Shit, okay, I need to make some calls. I think it's time for us to go anyway, Phil said, straightening up. Tubbo? Ronbu? Do you need our numbers? I got them from your phone, Bill, Tubbo said casually. Phil frowned. How did you- He cut himself off, seeming to realize what a dumb question that was considering they were talking to a hacker. Never mind. We'll let you know as soon as we have anything, Ronbu said, standing up so he could walk them to the door. And if you need anyone for anything like spying or infiltration, I can teleport, so uh, feel free to contact me. I might not know computers like Tubbo does, but I'm going to help in any way I can. It was such an earnest offer, and although Wilbur wasn't sure if they were going to need someone with teleportation skills for finding Tommy, he could tell that Rombu just wanted to feel like he was doing something. They were all searching for something to cling on to, something to make them feel like they were actually working towards saving Tommy. Thank you, Rombu, Wilbur said, nodding at him. We'll let you guys know. The three of them pulled their masks on again, and after one last round of goodbyes, Siren, Zephyrus, and Blade found themselves heading out of the apartment building. Wilbur didn't realize how much he had been running on adrenaline until he got back into the car, practically collapsing into his seat. His head was aching, his chest still tight from his panic attack earlier. The car started up, and Wilbur stared at his hands in his lap. It could take them several days to find Tommy and that was assuming Tubbo's plan would work. Wilbur knew he shouldn't be worrying himself sick over what could be happening to Tommy right now. He should be focusing on what to do now. He should be calling Quackity, calling puns, asking anyone and everyone he could think of for information on Dream. But as the car rumbled down the street, Wilbur felt frozen. His heart sat in his throat, and all he wanted was to wake up from this living nightmare. Wilbur barely registered the ride home. One moment they were in Eastside, pulling away from Tubbo and Rambu's apartment, and the next they were pulling into their garage. The door to his left opened. Will, you gonna come inside the house? Phil asked, his voice gentle. Wilbur knew he should get up, but he was staring at Tommy's backpack sitting by his feet. He's going to hate me when we get him back. Wilbur whispered. And he should. I deserve it for putting him in danger. Wilbur, it wasn't just you who got him involved. We all did. Phil reminded him, placing a hand on his shoulder. But I'm the one who started it. I'm the one who gave Techno his number. I'm the one he decided to save in the alley that day. He curled further in on himself, the seatbelt he was still wearing tugging against his shoulder. If he hadn't saved my life, he'd be all right right now. He'd be safe. Wilbur literally owed Tommy his life. And this was how he repaid him. By being stupid enough to let him get kidnapped. But he chose to save your life, because that's the kind of person he is. Phil said, squeezing his shoulder. Not to mention, it's not like you asked him to save your life. You were unconscious at the time. Yeah, but... Wilbur's breathing hitched. I've just been so fucking selfish this whole time. I've been taking advantage of the fact that he doesn't know I'm Siren and asking him stuff he'd never tell me as Wilbur. I've dragged him into a whole mess. When he repeatedly told me he didn't want to get involved, I just... I've been such a fucking asshole to him and he doesn't even know it. His eyes started to burn again, and he squeezed his eyes shut as a shuddering breath ran through him. He's such a good kid, Phil. He's so good, and he deserves so much better than this. Will? I want him to hate me when he gets back. Wilbur continued, his voice cracking. But I know him, and he's going to forgive me anyway, because that's the kind of person he is, and I don't deserve his forgiveness. Wilbur. I... 
I just don't know how I'm going to face him when we get him back. He confessed. How am I supposed to- Wilbur! Wilbur went silent, looking up at Phil through tears. Phil placed a hand on Wilbur's cheek, using his thumb to wipe away a stray tear. Whether or not you believe Tommy should hate you for what happened, it's his choice whether to forgive you or not. But if he does, you shouldn't try to take that choice away from him and tell him he shouldn't. What you need to do instead is work towards that forgiveness, to try and make things right, even if Tommy believes that it's fine. Don't just sit and mope about how you deserve to be hated. Phil told him, his stare so intense, Wilbur felt like it was burning a hole into his head. You're not perfect, Wilbur. You've made mistakes, and so does everyone else. What's important is that you recognize when you're fucked up, and you put in the work to fix it. Wilbur nodded. That made sense. Okay. I think I get it. He whispered. Phil smiled at him. Then let's go inside and find our boy. All right. Let's find him. <laughs>